Bob Mover, and I'd like to welcome you to On the Real Side. And uh, today we have a very distinguished guest. Well, our guests are usually pretty much always distinguished in some way or another. Um, and uh, I would like to you to all meet my good friend Joe Lovano, who is our special guest today. Thanks, Joe, for being here. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation, Bob. I've been looking forward to it, man. Yeah, me too, man. Well, Joe and I, I, I guess we could say we go back quite a while. Um, it's been a few years, yeah. The first time <laughs> I remember meeting you, and Jamie Haddad told me something very nice about something you said that night, which I didn't know, but I was at a place in Detroit uh, called Baker's Keyboard, playing with Chet Baker there. Um, for those of you who don't know, Baker's keyboard had nothing to do with Chet Baker. The owner was Clarence Baker. But um, Joe and Jamie Haddad were also in Detroit that week playing with uh, the great organist Lonnie Smith at a different club. And I remember you guys coming in. Our gig ended a little later than yours, I think. Or it may have been a night off or whatever it was, but mm. you and Jamie came in. And uh, you started to come in uh, pretty much almost every night that we were there. You guys were there for the last set. And did you sit in with us? I thought you might have sat in. I did, yeah. Uh huh. That's when I really met you and Chet and uh, Harold Danko was playing piano, you know. Uh, yeah. And I had just joined Lonnie and he was living around the corner from Baker's keyboard. Uh huh. Uh, we were playing at the Mozambique, another club that was in Detroit. Yeah. And kind of just, uh, I was just starting to play in his band, and we were on our way to New York to record. With him. And, and uh, Jamie yeah. said that, you know, you were listening to us, and you said to Jamie, you know, if this is how they're playing in New York, we got to get there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was around 1974. And I ended up moving to New York in 76. But that was uh, the first time I went to New York to play was with Lonnie Smith. And it was right at that moment because we went uh, and recorded for Groove Merchant, Sonny Lester's label. Okay, so that was 74. That was before I even went to, uh, went to Europe with Chet and before I went to Brazil. I thought it was 75, but... You know, I, guess I think you... the record, my, the recording we did came out in 75. So I'm pretty sure it was 74, but it was in the, that that period, you know. And the, the one thing that happened that was so incredible that night, I sat in with you cats, man, and I was so excited to play. And the top of my horn, like where the neck goes into the body of the horn, that socket, yeah, kind of broke off. And uh, I had a, a I had a, a, a Mark VI Selmer, and uh, but it was kind of a newer horn, you know, one of the later Mark Sixes from the early seventies. And uh, the socket broke off, and you sent me to Saul Frompkin's repair shop, and Saul Frompkin was an incredible. Uh, craftsman. Because right, you parent. were heading to New York right the next day or something, right? And the, yeah. It broke we were, in Detroit. It broke in Detroit when I sat right. in with y'all. And then you sent me to Saul Frompkin and he re soldered that whole socket and I made the record date. <laughs> uh -huh. well, you that know. moment. But that, that was an introduction to the New York scene, man. And you sent me to Saul, which was, uh, I can never thank you enough for that, because he oh, was amazing, man, through the years. To he know. was amazing, and his his yeah. shop was like a center. You never knew right. who you would run into. Right, right. Shop, you know. I once had the most beautiful duet, just totally playing free with Jimmy Lyons. Ooh, Great yeah. alto player, you know, with, right. the, with, with Cecil, Taylor. Cecil Taylor. Yeah. Cecil Taylor. And Jimmy was in there one day getting his horn fixed, and I was getting my horn fixed. And we just started doodling. And the next thing I know, man, we were playing this incredibly beautiful freedom yeah. with each other, you know? And oh, I nice. met Dexter Gordon in that shop. 
I met Dexter there once too, man. Having a day with Dexter, which was incredible. <laughs> you know, we went out Ponte's, drinking. Ponte's was right next door somehow, 46th Street there. And that was yeah, another well, amazing shop, you know. Well, Ponte's and Manny's was next door to yeah. that. Oh, right. I used to go, I used to go visit Street. Kenny Dorham when he worked at Manny's. Mm, I would right. bring him a coffee or a Coca-Cola and sit and talk with him about music and life. And he'd get up to serve a customer for a minute and then come back and talk more with me. <laughs> and, you know. That was an amazing period in New York. There was so much going on just in that little area, you know, in Midtown. Yeah, you know. this was, uh, wow. you know, I once blew my neck off too. I, I was playing with Konitz and we were playing at Sweet Basil and the same thing happened to me. I finished the solo and my neck just fell off onto the floor. Fortunately, it didn't crack my mouthpiece or anything, which was right. good. Right. I right. Out, is in the microphone. He says, well, ladies and gentlemen, Bob Mover just blew his neck off. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, man. Yeah. Well, but, things, um, things happen out there, and you have to be ready, you know, for for anything. Man. Yeah, you know, Junior Cook used to live at Saul Franklin shop. Saul always had booze. We might mm -hmm. add that mm -hmm. if you could, if you stopped in to see Saul, he usually had a bottle of something. Yeah, which were four roses, uh -huh. something like that. And, uh, you know, Junior Cook was there all the time, just hanging out. And He was great, man. One of the most generous people, man, that you could meet, too, man. Yeah. Let everybody, like, he would play and sit in, and but he'd let people play with me and sit in with him, like, just the drop of a hat, man. Yeah, we, we carried yeah. each other home for many an after-hour session. Yeah, and uh, <laughs> Bill Hardman was playing with him a lot. Who That's was right. Also who exactly. was also from Cleveland, where I'm from, and knew my dad. Oh. So I had, uh, I had a little connection with uh, with Bill Hardman there also, man, who was one. I didn't know that two. Bill was originally from Cleveland. Um, yeah. He played he with Walter Davis and I in Paris, mm. and he was very agoraphobic toward the end of his life. He didn't want to mm. leave mm. the house. You had to go pick him up mm. at his apartment and take him to the gig and get him home. He didn't want to be alone. He was uh, mm -hmm. wow. going through some, some weird changes then. But what a beautiful man he was. Oh yeah, a great kid. Cat, you know? And he kind of came up under Benny Bailey, who was also from Cleveland. More my dad's age. My dad was born in '25, and oh. uh, Benny Bailey also was from that generation, and they kind of came up together. Uh, but Benny oh. then, of course, went to Europe and lived in Europe and. Uh, but that whole crowd of folks that were in my dad's generation were all my mentors, teachers as a kid. Yeah. Really? I'm going to get into that in a minute because I wanted to talk about your dad and all that. I didn't realize all those cats were from Cleveland. I, I had a little encounter with Benny Bailey in Europe one time. Mm. He, he gave me a bit of wisdom, which I'll never forget. He said, if you're going to drink and get high and do stuff like that, Never do it if your lady is with you on the road. <laughs> oh, yeah? Road, you know. If you're on the road with a lady, behave yourself. <laughs> oh, okay. Because with there the cats, you, you do anything you want. But yeah, if you're right. with a lady, you got to behave yourself. And um, so, you know, your father, I mean, your dad, Tony, known as Big T, right? Yeah, right. Uh -huh. Was uh, a tenor saxophone player as well. He right? played tenor, yeah. And was one of the, you know, when he came home from the service, uh, late 40s, you know, mid 40s, he, he was one of the major players around town and um, came up with that whole crowd. You know, Tad Dameron was from Cleveland also. That's right, wow. And my dad had played, played some with him and uh, played opposite a lot of groups. My mom remembers hearing my dad like opening for Flip Phillips and Stan Getz when they were engaged, you know, and going in oh. here. And there was a club there, Lindsay Sky Bar, where everybody played. Well, my dad was in some of the house groups in that I see. place. So the, like that was, uh, that was great growing up, knowing some of that history. Did he have another um, profession as well? Yeah. As oh yeah, my dad was, he was a barber. I heard that. Yeah, I remember you told me. You know, me in the, the Italian tradition, you know, he was a barber and and played jazz and was really um, his 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 music supported his barbershop career and the 
vice versa also <laughs> you know. but he had uh you know he my dad didn't have desires to move to new york and stuff and he raised a family i have my sister and two brothers you know and my youngest brother anthony is one of the leading drummers i'd say around cleveland today and uh, leads a few different blues bands and has created situations around town um, for others, you know, like in jam session settings and, and organizing stuff. Where so was your because, place in the uh, age hierarchy in your family? Uh, I was the oldest. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. I'm the oldest. My brother Anthony's 10 years younger. But I'm so proud of him because he's taken on a certain role my dad had being a leader. And creating gigs for other people too, you know. And uh, I mean, I've kind of done that as well along Go my on. along my journey. You know, that's always been a real focus. And my my dad was a real mentor in that kind of way. You know, as well. Well, you know, Den our friend Dennis Irwin used to refer to you affectionately as the class president. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah, that's what he called you. Because we said, you know. <laughs> Because you kind of had the same, maybe a nucleus of friends mm, mm. that you've had for many years. And these cats, you've been very loyal to them and they to you. You know what I mean? It's been a very um, nice. Well, kind know, of relationships are everything. You know that, Bob. And like, it seems like every band and every situation you end up putting together becomes a family band in a certain way. You live together, you explore a certain repertoire together with different people, and uh, it keeps growing and growing and is always has a freshness because it's a, it's a, a, a celebration every time you gather. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's a, the gathering is a very important part of the, that's a good word. Yeah, you know, and you can feel that when you listen to, to folks play you know different bands through the years that that it have influenced us whether it's the jazz messengers or horace silver's groups or max roach's bands and you know miles coltrane i mean the the groups that really capture you yeah, are folks well. that have the relationships like the whole blue note record uh, stable of players that would collaborate and different leaders would emerge with their compositions. But like Billy Higgins was on so many dates, you know. Yeah, and Sonny Clark. Yeah, Sonny Clark and, and different folks. And But every time they would gather, man, there would be a lot of love there, you know. And that's what, what always made me want to play more, you know, and try to get myself together. Well, you know, the first band I remember you being part of was actually some a band that I went to hear two nights in a row, and I don't usually do that. <laughs> I mean, you know, but yeah. uh, I was uh, very fascinated by this particular trio, and and actually, you know, it's unusual. It's like Benny Carter. One time we were talking about, I said I'd discover the Chocolate Dandies, and he and I said there was some stuff you were doing that was really really innovative, like with whole tones and these kind of things. You know, it's some of the Fletcher Henderson stuff, a study in frustration and these things. He said, well. He said, I know, he said, there were times, I don't know how often people do this now, but he said, we'd be sitting there, we'd listen to what we just did at a session, recording session, they play it back, we'd say, well, never heard nothing like that before. He said, so, you know, that seems to have lost, he felt the music had kind of lost that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As, it, as it got older itself, you know, he said, uh, but, you know, I, I had a feeling like when I heard this trio with you and Frizzell and Paul Modian, I had mm. never heard anything mm. like that, you know. And Modian's, um, okay, you know, there's there's three music, two musicians and a drummer, but Modian was a real exception to that in the sense that his compositions were so intelligent, and he was using his Turkish heritage, and he had all this, um, you know. I mean, that was quite a quite a trio. How well, did you about it was, that? It was amazing, man, because Bill and I both started playing with Paul in 1981, and we stayed together till Paul's passing in 2011. So for 30 years, Bill and I were exploring music and playing with such an open uh, conception that was developing all the time. And it was all about listening and dealing with the repertoire in such a way that we never lost 
the the sound of the song we were in that's know? what i liked so much about it because yeah you know that like that it. was that that's what really like drove us to try to uh be ourselves within the composition as well as creating that kind of uh, flowing uh approach as a trio with guitar saxophone and drums you know i think you were at the 1369 in boston with that used band. To play I, there. I was visiting my oh, dad oh right and, okay. okay and that's where i heard you guys on two nights in a row mm, mm. and the last time i heard you actually was at the vanguard around 2009 or 10. Mm, uh, mm. you know and uh yeah yeah it was still happening you know that was uh well you know we did a we had a, a lot of recording opportunities that we played and and all we recorded mostly his originals but we did the Thelonious Monk recording we did like three different Broadway uh sessions that Charlie Hayden played bass and we did as a quartet with bass my kind of Broadway and, I think they were called was that was it? yeah on Broadway and there was the third one had Lee Konitz with us so it was a quintet session well, which was a lot really of fun because really Lee played with Lenny Tristano with Paul you know yeah and, that's the... with Warren Marsh and all kinds of so they had a relationship that went back but like that far uh so that was that was a lot of fun and we ended up touring once in Europe Mark Johnson played bass with us uh with Lee so we did a nice quintet tour uh with the, with the quintet doing that repertoire but we also did a Bill Evans record that Mark Johnson played on as a quartet and uh explored all kinds of music with Paul man the wow. Thelonious Monk 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 in Motion was a trio with Jerry Allen joined us on two tunes on piano and Dewey Redmond on two tunes uh, on tenor so monk in motion was the maybe the first one that kind of was a theme kind of an idea uh that was a springboard into some really beautiful things so the trio had a repertoire that was really phenomenal through the, through all those years you know that we would touch on from gig to gig yeah. well you know now your chronology is is interesting you know like you started out well, they had you what your dad had you start with the saxophone at about three years old? <laughs> <laughs> I had horns. Seven. I had horns as a kid, you know. Uh, I got my first tenor at twelve, but I played C melody before that, fifth and sixth grade, uh, and alto first. Yeah. So, uh, so I had horns from a kid, and also drums too. Like uh, one of the drummers that was playing with my dad. Gave, got a new set of drums in the 50s and gave my dad his older set which was one of those real big cozy coal kind of drum sets you know which ended up in our living room and then after a little while and it was in my bedroom so i started out you know fooling around on drums also as a kid so as i'm learning some themes and some melodies on a saxophone confirmation and different heads you know of some charlie parker tunes i would sit at the drums and play the rhythms because it was in my head yeah i did the same and, it's really interesting yeah so i started to really and that that was a real connection with the whole thing about rhythm melody melodic rhythm a lot of things when I look back now, came together because of that as a, as a young teenager, you know, basically by my teenage years, really getting into it. I, I had a similar thing. I didn't have very good coordination to play the drums, but I could tap the hell out of a table. Mm -hmm. There you oh, go. <laughs> you know, and I uh, got thrown out of many classes. They yeah, had right. Little wooden desks in the, in the <laughs> elementary schools. And I've been sitting there, you know, bop, but up and up, dip, you know, but up and up, 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 the Philly Joe breaks. Uh huh. Uh huh. And have all that, and would definitely get thrown out of class for that one. And I found that 
and you must have sung along with a lot of records as well. Was that? Oh yeah, vocalizing was a real, real strong uh, part of my development for sure. And my dad sang, also, you know. But uh, did he sing tunes like a singer, or did he just sing along? He did, with yeah, yeah. You know, as later in life when. Part of his thing? Yeah, part of his, uh, when he would play gigs, especially with some organ trios, he'd sing the blues, you know. Uh -huh. And every now and then sing a ballad or a tune, but mainly he sang the blues, you know. Well, you know, Sicilians and Brazilians, they die singing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, that's what, they almost, they sing anything, you know what I mean? Yeah, right, right. You know, and. Uh, but that know, vocalizing, 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 you know, because especially when you're listening to to whoever you're listening to that you love uh you retain it when you vocalize it with them you yeah know, you learn about the breathing and all of that you, know? you actually come as close almost closer than like if if i tell my students too the same thing i'd say rather than write the solo, solo down and worry about making it a visual thing and transcribing mm -hmm. it. and then if you want to play it take it from your voice mm -hmm. but you don't even ever have to play it you'll get the feeling of what it felt like to improvise it more by singing it oh, or correct. tapping the rhythms of a bebop head, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was reading in Rabbi Shankar's autobiography. Mm. He says that in India, they don't even give you an instrument until you can tap and sing the morning and evening ragas. Right, right. And then they give you an ax. But before then, you just, it's all visceral. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and yeah. your playing has that feeling Mm. I could tell that about you if I never met you, I would think that you had done that, you know. Right, right. Oh, nice. Man. All That's right. Something cool. In you. And uh, uh, you know, so um, you know, well, I was always I was always inspired by coming and hearing you, man, also and uh and being on the scene uh the way we were coming up like through the 70s and 80s and 90s in New York City was uh, incredible because there was so much music going on all the time. Man. Yeah. And that's that gave me a lot of opportunities to join the Woody Herman band like 1976, basically right soon after we first met, you know, and being a part of that band for almost three years and then joining the Mel Lewis band, 1980, playing every Monday night the Vanguard, playing Thad's music and Brookmeyer's music and uh, oh, yeah. having Bob come in when Thad split and went to Copenhagen. Uh, Bob came in and helped Mel kind of just reestablish the band again, you know, the way now, Mel- did you play a while with Thad in it? You, you, when you joined I the band, was Thad still there or was he just- about it, was, it was right at the beginning when he split when I joined the band. I had subbed a couple times when he was there. But then uh, 1980 is when he cut out and Brookmeyer kind of came in. And wow. that's when I first joined the band. And I, I was in the band till 91 when Mel passed, you know? So, right, like, you were there a long time, I remember. Yeah, it was, it was amazing, man. Cause that, every Monday night, man, to play with Mel. And then we did some touring also and recorded a bunch of things, but, uh, Oh man, Mel was in his heyday. He was in his fifties, all of the eighties, uh, and every tune was just a joyous feeling playing with him, man. Oh, that was great. Great. Yeah, yeah. I I worked a couple of small group gigs with him and had a really mm -hmm. good time. Oh yeah. Unfortunately, there was one gig where Sam Brown mm. was at the end of his life, and he was going having a nervous breakdown on the bandstand. Oops. And. Uh, that was a, you know, that's its whole story there. Mm -hmm. But, you know, Mel soldiered through it. Yeah. You know, right. we, we got through it. But um, the thing about Woody's band, I don't want to skip too <laughs> too much over. You know, I, I mean, the uh -huh. fact that you were on that band, did you, was Sal your fellow Sicilian? Well, did Sal I was there. I was there 10 years after Sal. Sal was there in the 60s. And right. then. He used uh, to come back sometimes, too, as I recall, was yeah, but he never did while, while I was there. He was oh. more living in Europe and stuff. But um, I got the gig. I went down. I sat in with uh, Albert Daly at Folk City. Remember that scene? On I Sunday? used to play every Saturday. Yeah. Every right. Sunday, Albert would start with duets with me. Yeah. And everybody right. else would play. 
Well, there you go. I was down there a bunch of times, and uh, Carter Jefferson. That's where Dennis Irwin and uh, Harold and Adam White, Nussbaum, Harold White, Adam. That's Adam. when I really first met Adam, and we all played together for the first time. Wayman Reed used to hang out there. Uh huh. Yeah. And uh, Carter was playing with Woody Shaw, and he he would show up and play. You know. Yeah. But anyway, one one Joe Romano. Who played tenor? Yeah, Syracuse Beautiful. guy, right? Rochester. Yeah, from from Rochester. Right. He uh, he was on Woody's band with Sal. Yeah. Sixties, the right? There's a there's a real hip video, uh, a clip on YouTube with them playing Sister Sadie or something. You know, I heard them one night yeah. in Cincinnati, Ohio. Mm -hmm. They sat in after Woody's band played a club called the Living Room. I lived six months in Cincinnati when I was fifteen. Okay. The story. And we went out afterwards. My teacher was Gordon Brisker. It was a great scene down there. Yeah, I know yeah. Gordon. And Gordon sat in. The, there were four tenor players. Sal, Joe Romano, Gordon Brisker, and a guy named Jimmy McGarry. Jimmy McGarry, yeah. And Who Ed played Moss. beautiful. Yeah, like a Stan Getz type of player, you know. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And Ed Moss was the piano player. Right, and, right. And it might have been Mike Moore and Jimmy Madison mm -hmm. because they were living in Cincinnati at the time. Right. But right. anyway, I heard that this four tenor session <laughs> and they all played great. But if, if one guy stood out that night, I think Joe, Rov Joe Romano kind of got the best of everybody. Though they oh, also wow. All right. Right. He was amazing. He played a beautiful lead alto too. He played in Buddy's band, all kind of gigs, lead alto. That was uh, also, he was really- yeah, He's a good alto player. Known from that, yeah. Anyway, I had met him in Rochester earlier on, like, Right around the time we met, early 70s, going through Rochester, I sat in with him one time, so we knew each other. And anyway, he showed up at uh, Folk City. We played together. I gave him my number. I was staying with Billy Drews and Steve Slagle and some cats that had a loft on uh, 26th Street. 26th Street. Yeah. So I give him my number. About four or five days later, I get a call from Woody's... Uh, road manager bill Byrne from the woody herman band saying that joe romano just recommended me but i have eyes to come out to st louis to join the woody herman band right it's the 40th anniversary year so it turned out they called joe and he didn't want to go back on the road and gave him my number and that's how that whole thing happened you know and it was just by chance you know uh, playing at Folk City with Albert and playing with Joe and then boom. So then I stayed on Woody's band for two and a half years and it was that 40th anniversary period. So Stan Getz would play with us and Zoot Sims, Al Cohn, Jimmy Jufri. I mean, was, we did the Carnegie Hall recording on RCA. And, was that the famous concert, Joe, where the guy started to throw money? He threw money, yeah. Band? Right, for the four brothers. We played we played all the parts. So Zoot and Al, Jimmy Jufri and Stan Getz are playing up the solos. Someone threw four fifty dollar bills. And then Woody got on the mic. He said, What? No hundreds? And he threw four one hundreds and then Zoot grabbed it all and split. That was the story. Zoot yeah. bless him, him and also Jimmy <laughs> Roll. Jimmy Rolls was there and both of those cats <laughs> cut out. Oh, they were a team. They were, they were supposed to play more. Zoot was supposed to play more on the concert. But Wait, he, he left. I didn't know that. I he didn't took know. the bread. They he scooped up the money and and bolted. You know, that's his humor. <laughs> Only from, Zoot would have that. Yeah, kind of yeah. So here I'm, 23 at the time, and it was like a springboard for everything. You know, that's after funny. after the Lonnie Smith MacDuff <laughs> period, yeah. but uh, playing my part. Like we played early autumn at the mic with Stan playing lead with our saxophone section. Frank Tiberi, you know, who was another incredible mentor for me. Uh, anyway, I, I stood next to Stan. Yeah, you know, to play my part with Stan, I didn't want to just play my notes. I had to play with a sensation and a feeling to support his lead, you know, and I learned all that from playing with my dad, you know, how to try to blend with folks and not just blow through your horn and play the notes, make your notes have some kind of feeling to them. 
you know yeah. and uh that was a big moment man yeah my you know, aunt, my aunt rose and my sister laura my aunt rose brought my sister laura they came to new york they were kind of right in the front man she, she came to new york and uh was so excited because she heard Stan at Jazz at the Philharmonic when they came to Cleveland, you know? And uh, my Aunt Rose was a real jazz person, you know? And uh, mm. She was she your, was, your father's sister? My No, my your mom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And they were, had on both sides of the family that way too. Yeah, they were, they were so close. And my Aunt Rose was a real, uh, she, you know, like I said, she went to jazz at the Philharmonic and heard Ella and Stan and everybody when she right. was a kid, you know, and uh, that was beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that made me think of something. Um, that, um, you know, I remembered when you were uh, that apartment with or that loft. I, I was trying to remember what street it was on. It was. You might have been at. You might have been on my loft too at Twenty Third Street and Seventh Avenue. Now, did that used to be Vanguard Studios? Was right next door. Was next, next door, door, right? Right. So, you know, two oh six, two oh eight was next was Vanguard. I was two oh six, and was there for over twenty five years. That's where I was because what happened was seven. I had a fire in my building do you remember this years ago there was a fire and i was living on leroy street mm. and my building i had to evacuate my building for six weeks while they renovated it after this fire where uh, right. Right. You know, we had to run out the building was on fire very scary moment you know ah. from the fifth floor right. you know i didn't have to jump off the fire escape i got down the fire escape right right but anyway i stayed a few weeks a couple of weeks with claudio roditi who was in the mm -hmm. neighborhood too on like 16th street, <laughs> 16th street you know he and, was great he was beautiful oh he was one of my best yeah. Teachers, you know? yeah and uh but claudio after a couple of weeks we got along great and i probably could have stayed there longer you know but um it just happened to be that i ran into you i think it was you or dennis Irwin, mm -hmm. and you guys said well why don't you come by our place you know we're playing a lot over there mm -hmm. and you guys were playing constantly I mean, rhythm section would parade in and out of that place. I was so fortunate, man. I could play with drummers till midnight at my Yeah, house. yeah, yeah. You could, and, and Drews was there. Yeah. He was mm -hmm. there, and he was playing drums and tenor. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dennis was, was there. I don't know. And uh, and Steve Slagle, and you, and then me. So it was like the five of us. Right, right. There. And I spent almost I, I, at least two or three weeks with you guys there. Yeah, at my loft and also Billy and and because Dennis was staying up at 26th Street at Billy's loft also. So between the two places, we we played every day together. It was incredible. Yeah, it was great. Right there in Chelsea, you know. And then I had a similar thing. We had a fire at the late 90s in our building, an electrical fire that changed the whole everything. Uh, so that's when I left that area and and moved a little more upstate. But uh, yeah, New York City, man, something else. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I made a big mistake. Wait a way, I don't want to talk about mistakes, but I left at the height of all that because I wanted to be a daddy, and I was mm. so busy in New York. Mm. And, and you know that I mean it was a strange thing to do. First, I I went to Boston for. Oh, yeah, I remember. Yeah, I remember you were in Boston, right? Yeah, I just wanted to kind of. Um, well, actually, I told people I was having too much fun. <laughs> you know, and uh, so I wanted to live. I wanted to make it to thirty, and uh, I was about 20, 20, <laughs> 28 when I decided I needed to take a year off. I had a brief marriage, and uh, went up to Boston. And then Chet Baker called me I, after a, I taught three semesters at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. and I had everybody of the next generation. It was amazing. My students were like Dave Kukowski and, and right. Bradford Marsalis and Greg Osby and mm -hmm. Ozo, all these, you know, right. all these cats were Je Jeff Tain watch was in my ensemble and nice. you know, Henry yeah. and all these cats, you know, were Donald Harrison. Anyway, they were all there and I this was three semesters and Chet Baker called me up and he says, uh, so you're teaching at Berkeley? I said, yeah. He said, 
aren't you a little young to be out to pasture? <laughs> he uh -huh. said, I got, I, got, I got eight weeks in Europe. You uh -huh. want to come with me, just me and you? We'll just go around and play with rhythm sections. And oh, that's great. So I ended up doing that. And then from there, I, um, it just became, uh, I was going to, I met a woman and we were going to have, she wanted, she said, I'd be a good father. I thought that would be good to do. I had not thought about it before. And uh, <laughs> it seemed, so I had a teaching offer in Montreal and I did that. And then, yeah. Uh, I think we hung out in Montreal one time also. Yeah. I saw, and, and well, I, I saw you up there. Uh -huh. You know, I would miss the city, but I just took a different direction in life. And I said to Paul Blay, I remember Paul Blay was hilarious. Blay says to me, I said, well, I'll be close to New York. In fact, I could probably get from Montreal or Toronto to New York by plane quicker than somebody could get to Long Island with traffic. He, right. said, yeah. he said, it's still the same, though. I don't care. If you leave New York, you can go to Canada. It's the same as going to Australia. You're not in New York anymore. <laughs> yeah. You're out of town. Right. right. And right. I, I didn't know how affected, how that, how true mm -hmm. that actually was because, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I live and learn. So, right. well, we all do. You know, I, I feel I, I've been so fortunate, man. I, in 2001, I got received a, a great honor from Gary Burton to, uh, be the first recipient of the Gary Burton chair in jazz performance at Berkeley. So I've been doing that since then. And I go four times a semester. I don't have to live up there. I go four times a semester for a two and a half day intensive. And now I'm working with Danilo Perez and John Patitucci within the global jazz, uh, Institute at Berkeley. And, uh, like you, like you also, when different generations of players that you encounter when you're at a place like Berkeley or New England Conservatory or Eastman or where it's been a phenomenal bunch of years addressing the future with some of the great players that have emerged now on their own today. You know, that's when I first played with Esperanza Spaulding. She was uh, placed in one of my ensembles. You know, Lawrence Fields, Leo Genovese, so many cats. Kendrick Scott, uh, Walter Smith now. He was on, in my first ensemble that year. And uh, now he's head of the woodwind department. You know, to see, to see these folks really get deep into the music and the passion about trying to find themselves... Uh, has been inspiring, man, all these years. And uh, but but I feel like I, really fortunate because I didn't have to move to Boston to do that. Yeah, that was. Uh... I could just make a little trip four times a semester and and spend some time dealing with all kinds of folks and and issues about life and uh, the embrace of all things and uh, addressing the future. Like well, you actually did go to Berkeley. Um, you, uh, I did in the early like '71 and two. I was there, and I was there with Schofield. You Bill, were there with Schofield. Yeah, Bill Frizzell, Kenny Werner, Joey Barron, uh, Billy Drews, and Steve Slagle, and so many cats, man. But the, our our little community, we all moved to New York in the mid '70s. We did. I was. We, um, yeah, I've been playing and doing stuff together ever since, man, especially with Schofield and Frizzell for me. In know? fact, I saw you and Schofield, an interview you guys did, and I wanted to thank you uh, because you were talking <laughs> about Boston in those years. Right, and right. You said something about that I was around Boston making everybody nervous, <laughs> something like that at that time. Well, you you know, you were challenging, man, because you, you have such an execution on your horn and a wisdom and knowledge of of the depth of the music and that's sharing those blessings with everybody is what it's all about. Man. Well, we were all blessing each other. You know, I mean, I remember yeah. I had a gig in a bookstore. Schofield told me this, this was his first jazz gig. I had a friend who had a bookstore store in Kenmore square. Uh -huh. And you know, he just heard me somewhere like playing in Cambridge or something. And he said, Oh, I got this bookstore. Would you like to come in on Saturday 
afternoons and uh he said i'll give you like if you can get a guitar player maybe play duets i'll give you 10 bucks which was five dollars each which yeah, at right. that time it being like what 1968 69 <laughs> something like that uh -huh. it was pretty good it was something and uh that was the story it was funny i went all over i had to find a guitar player i said great i'll do it and this was funny i, I went to berkeley and i started listening to each if I'd hear a guitar, I'd stand outside the practice room. Yeah, right, right. And I found a couple cats, and I went in, and I said, hey, could we play a tune, you know, this and that. And I'd play a duet with a guy, and the guy sounded pretty good. And I'd say, well, you know, I have this bookstore. Would you want to play with me there? And they say, you know what, man? I got too much homework. I got too, you know <laughs> what I'm saying? That's weird. You want to be a musician, but you got too much homework. Okay. Yeah, right. So finally, I heard a guy scuffling through all the things you are really making a valiant attempt. He couldn't really play very well, but he sounded pretty good. You know, he didn't sound bad. He sounded okay. Yeah. yeah. From the door and uh, it was Sko. Uh -huh. So uh, we played a duet and I said, you know, I have this little thing in a book. Where is it? When do I get there? What yeah, time? Right, you know, right, this is right. a week or, and we did it for the next, um, oh, next month or so. And they even we did so well that we he gave us an extra five bucks for a bass player. There you go. So um, <laughs> John said one night we were at a festival and he told everybody, he said, you know, this was my first jazz gig. He said, I played rock gigs and this and that. And I said, John, don't tell me, tell Downbeat. Yeah, right. Uh, but, uh, um, uh, no, but that was a great it. period back then at the school because it was so small, man. You you knew everybody that was there, you know, you knew how they played and where they were coming from. and uh, Yeah. And it's and amazing. James Williams and Bill Pierce, they were around town too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and uh, mm -hmm. you know, there was, and then Jackie Byer was teaching over at Jackie's the over there. And sure. And Gunther Schuler was president over there. And uh, Jimmy Jufri and Rand Blake at the third stream department at New England was incredible. Yeah. I got friendly with Ed Schuler during that time. And that's when I met Gunther and Ricky Ford and Bob Hanlon, a bunch of, bunch of cats. Were yeah. Going. Bobby Hanlon, you know, I used but to... it was a real small scene, but I was, I ended up going and playing sessions at New England conservatory also. That was really eye opening and different than Berkeley. You know, it had a different, added different vibe and different energy, especially with different. Gunther, with Gunther as, as, um, leading the the whole all the troops over there well i used to go to ed's house on the weekends uh and uh play stay over yeah and, and gunther would pick me up at the train station incredible right newton you know and right. we had this uh -huh. david stewart on piano and ricky ford right boots mailson uh, Leon Boots Mills Boots, was playing bass Boots. a lot of time with us. Yeah. Uh huh. And, uh, you know, it was a, just a wonderful, you know, scene. And we were, uh, that was about a year or two ahead of you, I think, that I was uh, there. Yeah, I was there 71 and 2, you know. So you were there maybe right earlier. Well, I was there, yeah, 68, 69. Yeah. And 70. I, I, I moved to New York in March of 1972, mm. my 20th okay. birthday. There you go. Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, we hadn't met yet, though. No, no. A couple years later. A couple years yeah. later in Detroit. Like you, know, and, yeah. and, uh, you know, a couple of times I remember experiences we had together. The last time we played together was, was a ball. And I have a videotape of it. I don't know if uh, Charles mm -hmm. Carlini gave you that, but it was uh, mm -hmm. when they had the tsunami from Japan. Right, right. And you and I co-led a set together with a, a nice quintet. We had um, uh, Ed Howard and Steve Williams, and uh, we played two tunes, and Kikoski. Where was that? Tune. Where did we play? At the High Line Ballroom. High Line Ballroom, right. And Bob Albanese played a tune with us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we play Hot House, and we play Yesterdays. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's actually quite nice. I should get it oh, to you. Right. Yeah, I'd love to hear that. It's on a hard drive. Right, and, uh, wow. Another thing that sticks out to me is one night in Belgium. Uh, do you right. remember? That we funny played... place, the Travers. That yes, so you were across the place. street. You had the good gig. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I had the, the not so good 
Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I came and heard you, man. You were playing some music, man. Well, you came and sat in. What we did is we actually ended up timing our sets so we could play with each other. Because mm, mm, mm. you would take your break, and on your break, I'd be going on, and I'd play my set, and you'd sit in with me, and then you'd leave toward yeah, the end right. of my set to start your set. <laughs> and then when my set finished, I'd leave and go over and play with you. Yeah, right. Oh, so uh -huh. actually, we spent that night playing uh, on each other's gigs, which was like quite a... Brussels, there was a nice scene over there, man. A lot of folks. I just played there with my trio at, at the Flage, which is a nice, beautiful hall. But uh, that was during that period in the 80s. That was sometime in the 80s, I think. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah. that period there, it was a lot of, lot of music happening, a lot of young cats who now have emerged into doing some things on their own. Really beautiful, man. I yeah, saw a lot of friends. That's when I hooked up with Francois Louis and started playing his handmade wooden mouthpieces. You're still playing those mouthpieces? I do, yeah. On soprano. The first one I got from him in the early 80s on soprano, I still play. Made of granadilla, you know, and it's a beautiful mouthpiece. The wood mouthpiece is like an instrument all in itself. It vibrates with the reed instead of a reed against a mouthpiece, you know. <laughs> And that that uh, that feeling, for me, has really been something, man, to to develop within, you know, oh. uh, from real. And it doesn't change with um, the, like well, the some of them. The, the, the first one, the first one I got on tenor was made of boxwood, like a a recorder, and that right. moved with the that moved with the seasons. So then Francois made me one of the Grenadilla, like a clarinet, you know, and it's not a big nice piece of wood so it's not real thin and uh i haven't had any problems with those at all i take care of them though i never leave a wet reed on it i oil every now and then i'll put a little olive oil on there keep it nice but uh yeah i've been real lucky man real fortunate you know, speaking of gear and you know that expression i think it's hilarious it's called gas guitar players talk about it Oh, yeah. No, I don't. It's called gear acquisition syndrome. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, <I> guess. <laughs> right. You know, they're so, like, uh, fixated you know, on... Uh, saxophone players, we can get a little bit like that with... with oh, with, with mouthpieces and things, you know. Have you tried the Legere? The, there's a new, pla uh, you know, art artificial read or however you would call it, plastic or whatever. You know, I, I've tried a few of those and I play on my alto clarinet. I'll use one because, you know, or even like I've been playing a terragato, right? The Hungarian folk oh. instrument. And on that, on that horn, I, I put a synthetic reed because if I play a 90 minute set, I may only play that horn once, maybe twice throughout the set. Right. So, I feel like those synthetic reeds, they keep, they're, they're, you're ready to pick the horn up and play it. You don't have to worry about uh, making the reed play. You know? Right. So I use it on those horns, but on tenor, I don't, I don't, you know. Yeah, well, I'm about to try this Leger reed that uh, Roger Rosenberg recommended. Mm -hmm. And I found out Eddie Daniels is using it on clarinet. Mm -hmm. So, and they say they've got a new one. So, uh, no, they're interesting, man. Definitely. And, you know, now when they're, they're starting to make them so they're not just bright, squeaky kind of sounds. Yeah, I never found like the good. opponents like the Barry one. He was playing that one for a while. Uh -huh. I never could really, I mean, it sounded like an okay cane read at its best, but it never really gave me. Right. I use that Barry on the alto clarinet and it, it works nice. It works nice. Hmm. So um, when you have, were growing up, I was just curious about, I like to ask people about their spiritual backgrounds. In other words, did you go to, you know, you have a Catholic family, obviously, mm -hmm. at least by tradition. Oh, yeah. I went to catechism classes and went through all of that. And, you uh, go to parochial school or regular? Sunday, Sunday, I, you know, I went to a regular public school. I didn't go to Catholic schools. But we would go to catechism classes on Sundays, and uh, yeah, oh yeah, no, I grew up in a Roman Catholic family, you know, and uh, but also a kind of a spiritual feeling also about nature and about uh, 
you know, my grandparents came. So I'm second generation. All four of my grandparents from Sicily and uh, two villages, Alcada Le Fuse, were the Lovano Ferracci families. And then my mom's side of the family, Verzi Serenidi from Cisero. They're both province Messina up in the wilderness. Mm -hmm. So there's a real, there was a certain spiritual feeling from my grandparents in that whole area, that whole region. And, and like a connection to nature? Yeah, you know, and the whole thing with Mount Edna and the wilderness and all of that. And so I, I, I don't know. I, I just kind of grew up with a certain spiritual feeling, not even realizing what it was till later, you know, when you start to experience. And your your life's experience comes out in your music and in your whole vibrations as a as someone a living person, you know. Well, you know, you've had a kind of I mean, thank God. I mean, we have I have too, you know, but I mean blessed lives. First of all, just to be in all this joyful stuff we're talking about, uh -huh. you know, to have been a part of this jazz world and everything is, uh, especially there were so many tragic ends, uh, stories, you know, neither of us is one of them. So that's uh -huh. Uh -huh. kind of a, you know, thank you, God, every day. Yeah. You thank the give blessings every day, man. Give thanks for sure. And, you know, you feed off of the spirits and the joyous feeling of the, people you encounter and then folks that you never met man you know the, inspire me you know the spirits of ben webster and folks like that well yeah. you know my daughter emily my oldest daughter is a singer songwriter she's really good and she has one tune called new york city which i'll i'll send it to you because you'll mm -hmm. really like it but mm -hmm. the, the chorus of the tune is one thing is the city is a chorus of those who came before us, and I love the way they sound. <laughs> yeah, nice. Yeah. Oh, I, I think that's, uh, you know, you, uh, I think we're constantly aware that these are the streets that, uh, mm -hmm. you know, greatness has walked on. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's all inspiring, you know. When you play in certain venues, you feel the spirits around you and you call the spirits when you play you know? yeah i believe that you know you do especially rooms where you've played with other folks you know and uh they might not be with us right now but they'll always be with us like you you feel that you know and it's that's what uh i think through the generations that's always been part of the music man you know i think that is you know and um yeah, so I'm just trying to think of um, singers. He made a record with the Sinatra tunes and everything. And Celebrating you Sinatra, singing. yeah. Uh huh. And I had Manny Album do the orchestrations for me for his woodwinds and strings. And working with Manny Album was amazing. Yeah, because he we got together at my loft and we just talked about repertoire and. Uh, what he put together for me to to uh, embrace and to be a part of, and let me lead the proceedings also. Uh, he wrote in such a beautiful open way where he didn't tie me down, and he let me he let me be expressive with within each piece. You know, uh, that was inspiring. You know, Sinatra was somebody that I heard my whole life, man, and trying to pick the right tunes was not that hard because he recorded almost every song <laughs> that was written, you know. <laughs> so so I could go in a lot of directions. And uh, I had Al Foster and George Mraz. So we played as a trio within the orchestrations. And uh, that was also beautiful because uh, he, he, he let Al create his own drum part within the music. So Al was improvising. I was improvising, and uh, there was a real organicness about the whole thing. Mm. That was really fun. And then Kenny Werner was also, I did some quartet tunes within the recording, too, where Kenny played piano. And that, uh, like, we we did uh, The Song Is You and uh, 
this love of mine. We did a couple of tunes mm -hmm. as a quartet within that too. That was uh, really uh, uh, balanced the recording, you know. But uh, I've had a chance to record and play with a lot of singers that were influential for me, man. That one when I first joined Woody's band, one of the early gigs, we backed Sarah Vaughn for a week. Oh. Westbury Music Fair, right? And Jimmy Cobb was playing, Walter Booker, and uh, Carl Schroeder on piano. I remember Carl Schroeder. Yeah, and Where man... Pardon me? What happened to Carl Schroeder? You know, I'm not sure. Like, uh, that that was the last time I really heard about him so much. He was Sarah's accompanist for yeah, years. Yeah, that's not the only time I ever really... Uh, but but anyway, like listening and playing six nights behind Sarah was incredible, man. I was having a hard time just concentrating on my parts. I was like trying, I was listening to her so much, you know. And then once we did a week with Billy Eckstein, and it was one of the only locations that Woody's band ever did, and it was in Cleveland, which was amazing. So they had just reopened Playhouse Square in, the, in uh, the State Theater. It was a beautiful theater that, you know, all the bands played in the heyday of the big band era. But uh, Billy Eckstein, his book, the whole thing with him was amazing to play with him and to be on the stage with that vibration and the way he sang a tune to you. you yeah. Know? Uh, well, that same week, also, Carmen McRae played opposite us. You know, singers for me have been real influential, man. Uh, yeah, I, had a chance to I had a chance to record with Abby Lincoln on maybe the third to her last session uh, over the years, oh. which was one of the thrills for me to uh, be in the studio with her and then play a handful of gigs, like Alice Tully Hall, a couple, a couple moments uh, in California. And uh, Abby Lincoln was something else, man. Ah, oh, bless her, man. She was really. I never got to know her. Ooh, what a storyteller! And and the way she articulated and would accent different words at different times, like Tony Bennett also has that, you know. Uh, yeah, very. Yeah, Tony also was someone really important for me that uh, came to hear my Nanette play at Dizzy's and. Uh, because he also joined us with Woody's band on on uh, a handful of gigs mm -hmm. and playing behind Tony Bennett, too. Uh, and then he ended up calling me. I, I play on uh, the Lady Gaga session, Cheek to Cheek. He called me to play on some tunes. So I'll play on three or four pieces on that recording. And uh, Oh, that's great. That won a Grammy. And it, he was so beautiful in the studio because... When I went in, everything was laid down, the big band, the whole thing. It was just moments for me to play. So I went in, I made this one take. He wasn't there yet. I was trying to wait for him to come to the studio. But I was there, so we listened to the track. I went in, I made a take. Then he shows up. So we listened to the take, and he's he dug, he dug it and moved on to the next tune. And he asked me, uh, he says... Uh, can I ask you something? Which I thought he was going to tell, ask me to play in the low register or do this or something. Give me some direction. He said, could I take your picture while, while you're making a take? <laughs> <laughs> so he oh, came well, in. You. Yeah. Right. We did this at uh, Avatar, you know, at yeah. power station up there. He comes in he comes in while I got the headphones on. I'm making a take. He's he took some pictures of me and stuff. And then he ended up painting something. <laughs> I, I was thinking, yes, he would probably take anyway. It. He was so beautiful to work with and was a total jazz person, man. And that's why he sang like that. Every time he sang through whatever song it was, it was an experience, you know, and you felt that when you listened to it. But to be around him a little bit was uh, some treasured moments for me, man. Yeah. yeah, you know, my my dad was a trumpet player, and he had played with some big bands like Tommy Dorsey and Jerry Wald. Actually, he was on the Jerry Wald band with Al uh -huh. and Jimmy Rainey. Right. And, wow. Uh, 
you know, but he um, had his own band in Boston and he did a summer thing at a place called the Salisbury Beach Frolics. Mm. It's kind of a summer resort kind of thing in some part of Salisbury Beach, Massachusetts. But one of the artists that came in, they had different people, different weeks. He did a week with Billy Eckstein. And <clears throat> my mother was pregnant with me at the time. And uh, my dad had a picture of my mother, Billy Eckstein, my father, and me in my mother's belly with an electric train behind me, behind us. Right, right. And he said, well, that was um, a present that Billy got you. He said he knew you were going to be a boy. <laughs> he said, and uh, that's and so great. Got you this electric train. Plus, he was very happy because my dad, when he found out that Billy was coming to 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 play the gig, he got a special band, and he got uh, Serge Shaloff on baritone, and he got like you know a Herb on Herb and Joe Gordon on trumpets. Mm, and mm, Dick Twardzik mm. played piano. He wow, had, you know, like, had told, that. Billy told my dad that this band hadn't been his book hadn't played been played as well since he had the band. Wow. And you know, so and then he wanted my dad to be his. I think Bobby Tom Thomas, which is musical director, mm, right? But right. he was off at that point, so he was traveling without a musical director, and he asked my dad if he might want to be his MD. And my dad said and he had to wait for me to be born. He couldn't go on the road. <laughs> it already turned down South America with Tommy Dorsey. So, so anyway, the, the other stuff. Oh, was great, man. So you really grew up, you grew up in the whole history of the music. Well, we both did oh, in that way, you yeah. know, my dad, though, yeah. you know, it was a little bit more, more of the tragic side, but anyway, that's uh, neither here nor there, but, um, so were you from Bo you were from Boston originally? I was born in Boston, yeah. Oh, yeah. oh wow, okay. And then when we were when I was eleven, I moved to Miami. Mm. And then uh it's a travelogue after that. Well, you know, I went to, to New York at fifteen. I well, Phil Woods heard me. And you hooked up with Ira Sullivan down there too. I hooked up with Ira when I was sure. thirteen. Yeah, right. And he was, <laughs> he, was a, he was my <laughs> God bless Ira Sullivan, man. He was something. Did you get to know Ira a little? <laughs> a little bit, yeah. We played a couple of times. I used to sit in when him and Red had their group when they came back and did oh, that. Oh, Fat Tuesdays and yeah, at the at the Vanguard. I said, oh yeah, Joey Barron and Gary Dial, Jay Anderson, right? right? That quintet. Yeah, and I sat in with them too. Yeah, and then I played a couple of gigs with him that, that were really fun, man. He was amazing, man. Trumpet, <laughs> saxophone, and flutes, and <laughs> oh, yeah. Once in, Chicago, once in Chicago, too, sat in with him. And he said, I, I was playing at the showcase with my trio with Cameron Brown and Idris Mohammed. And uh, Ira came in and sat in with us. And man, that was uh, oh, that was beautiful. I played some trumpet. He he had his trumpet. Yeah, that would have been. Oh yeah, it was really something with a Drees on drums, man. It was like you know we stretched out. It was that was beautiful. Yeah, yeah Ira really understood how to play with drummers. You know, Ira understood how to. He used to tell me about you have to learn to use the rhythm section. Mm -hmm. And he told something. He said a story. He said when Train first came to Chicago with Miles. He, he was new on the band. And the cats were like, impressed. They said, Yeah, you know, he's definitely got something. But a lot of the Chicago guys you're talking about, you know, the Gene Ammons and the yeah, Gene Ammons. Clifford Jordans and John Gilmore and Nikki Hill and Vaughn, Vaughn Friedman and uh... Vaughn Friedman, all these cats, you know, they said, well, train sounded great. But there's something he doesn't know how to use the rhythm section. Mm -hmm. So then he said they came by about three or four months after and Ira said he had learned. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that was a deep crowd, Chicago crowd, that that generation. Yeah, it was a really uh, wow. You know, and oh, uh, yeah. Well, you had all those guys from Memphis there too. You know, you had the Booker Little and Stroger and George Coleman were all there and Mayburn and huh? those people. All kind of Chicago was the melting pot from pot for that. There, yeah. you know. And then there was the Indianapolis and uh, people like uh, the mm -hmm. Ohio. Mm -hmm. Rasad was always around Chicago at that time. And right, 
And he was from Columbus, and he was around Cleveland a lot too. You right, know. and uh, Joe Henderson, I think, was spending some time there. And yeah, he was from Lima, Ohio. Yeah, Lima, Ohio. Far, not far from Youngstown and Cleveland and all that. You know. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we yeah. get to, to uh, have experiences with Joe. Did you? Uh... A little bit. I mean, uh, we played a couple times together with, within a, a couple big band moments. There was one gig in Houston, kind of opening a new hall with a, with a big band. And George Coleman and myself and Joe Henderson were guests. And we each played solo things with the band and maybe played one thing together with three tenors. But that was one time to just hang out with him in a <laughs> a setting like that. But one time he won a Grammy. I was at the Grammys and Joe got a Grammy and we hung out at the Grammys together, which was really far out. Man. That was great. Just to, you know, to be together. And uh, But hearing him so much through the years, man. Beautiful, man. Joe Henderson was such a guiding light. Wasn't I remember the, the first earliest times in the early 70s in Cleveland he came with George Cables and Peter Yellen the band like that Pursuit of Blackness that record just came out mm -hmm. and then in Boston they played at uh, the Jazz Workshop and I remember I went to the Sunday matinee and I was there and Ricky Ford was there too and uh, Joe saw us with our horns and invited us to sit in and that was a that was amazing. Oh. Sit in. Lenny White was playing and uh Stanley Clark was that band with and George Cable, you know. So that was uh yeah, the the beginning of some real reality, <laughs> you know, <laughs> moments, you know. And that was that was just prior to when we met, you know. Uh -huh. I was going to Berkeley, you know. Now but, I wanted to also be I think it's I wanted to talk a little bit about, uh, of course, you know, you, you've had a lovely, beautiful marriage and relationship to Judy. Yeah. And, Judy, uh, Judy Silvano, man. She's, uh, she's a bright light for me in my life. That's for sure. man. Yeah. And she actually, uh, people said it was, it's amazing that they both were on O's and they met. And I said, I don't think it was quite like that. <laughs> no, Judy Sil Judith Silverman, and she ended up putting her names, our names together, Silvano. Because ever since you did, you know, I've been looking for a girl with the last name Shaker. <laughs> uh, I had a couple of Shakirs, but no, not the same. Yeah, right, right. Uh, that's great. So she put the names together. Yeah, and Judy came. She came to New York. She's from Philadelphia. And she was modern in the modern dance world. She's danced with Alvin Nikolai, Murray Lewis, and that school of dancers. And uh, also came up uh, through Temple University and the choirs and sang and played flute and modern dance. And we met in a, a, a real creative scene. Uh, one of her close friends, Robin Feld, they were in a dance company together and Robin was going, uh, she was with Paul McCandless, the oboe. From Oregon. And, yeah, from the group the Oregon. Group Oregon yeah. And uh, we collaborated. I was playing in a little woodwind ensemble with Billy Drews and Ron Kosak on flute and I was playing soprano, Billy on clarinet and Paul and Michael Boshin played acoustic guitar and Dennis Dotson on trumpet. We had a little wind ensemble that collaborated with the dancers. And that's how Judy and I met through that whole crowd, in the real creative modern dance world and, and uh, contemporary improvisations in New York, you know, like 1980, somewhere around there. So, and we've had an amazing journey together, man, through the years. And she's been a part of a number of my recordings. She's the voice on the Celebrating Sinatra recording and another universal language and uh, Viva Caruso. I've recorded with her on some of her projects. 
And now she's painting and doing all kinds of real creative, beautiful things. Man. Oh, it's wonderful. Yeah, so that's that's been really great to embrace each other's uh, developments and uh, be a part of each other's life, man. It's yeah, been, been so, it's terrific. Yeah. And a couple of things I was thinking too. Of course, our friend Hank Jones. Yes. Uh, oh, man. One of the... <laughs> How did Hank react? I always wanted to ask you this. And I'm sure he was very cool about it, but when Moti had walked in with only symbols. At the recording at session? The recording session. And and uh, I was just trying to picture Hank kind of like, mm -hmm, well, you know, I mean, I don't know. Did he? Well, uh, no, Hank, Hank was, because he knew Paul from the Bill Evans trio. So he knew Paul's name. They, I don't think they had ever played together. But he knew about the, the, the beautiful music uh, that Paul was a part of. And uh, when I did that recording, I'm All For You, a ballads project, the, co the combination of Paul and George Mraz and Hank was some real magical things, man. Because Paul was so excited to play with Hank because all of a sudden he's playing with someone that influenced Bill Evans. And mm -hmm. We did we did three different recording sessions, but we also played live at Iridium and we played at, at Birdland and some real magical moments, man. Because it's all about listening, you know, and creating that inner music together. And Paul was a master of that. And of course, Hank was a total master of that world of accompanying and leading, following, and uh, dynamics. Remember one night we played this, we're playing at Birdland, first tune, and we play that tune, Lady Luck. Beep, beep, boo, doo, 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 doo. It's a Fad Jones tune. Anyway, Hank plays an eight bar intro, and you know his intros, he was legendary with his intros. He played an unaccompanied eight bars, like really pianissimo, man. Swinging and like way down in there. And when Paul and I and George came in, Paul was on sticks. We played a, just a touch softer than his intro. And he, I remember him looking up <laughs> and smiling, you know, like, oh. <laughs> I was whispering and Paul had the symbol, on, a stick on the symbol, man, with the hippest touch you can imagine. And, uh, yeah, so there was a lot of things like that that happened with Paul and Hank that were just uh, magical. You know? Yeah, and Mraz and was George really too. Every situation. Oh, yeah, man, and he was he was everybody's favorite basses as far as piano player when Hank and Tommy Flanagan and uh, Sir Roland Hanna, you know. But uh, they had an amazing rapport, and being on the road with them was was something we went to europe a number of times and uh lewis nash came to europe and is on the last recording live at newport as with lewis on drums and they also had like a spark there was some other kind of energy when when lewis and hank played you know uh and dennis mccrell also who was playing uh, yeah hank was very fond of dennis yeah he was playing with with hank when i first started to play with them the first gig, actually, Hank called me for was to, to play at uh, Birdland and uh, with George and Dennis. And that was kind of the beginning. I called Bruce Lundvall and I, Bruce wanted me to maybe do a ballads album. He had been talking to me. And I, was, I didn't feel I was ready to really do it until I started playing with Hank. And I called Bruce and told him I was playing with Hank at uh, Birdland. And he came down, and him and Michael Kuskuna came down, and uh, that was that was at the very beginning of uh, talking Ooh. about recording. <laughs> well, yeah, Joe, it's been wonderful, man. It's been great to to get to know you even better. Yeah, Bob, thank you, man, for this opportunity and uh, and to see you and uh, have this little chat, man. It was beautiful. Thanks, man. Yeah, I enjoyed it immensely. And once again, we thank you. And Jesse, uh, thanks you. And um, wishing you continued 
love, love and success and uh, keep going. You too, man. Happy holidays. It's always a holiday out here. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, and we thank everybody for tuning in. And, uh, you know, if you, and we hope to, you, uh, you would like to subscribe, uh, you know, we'll uh, have the information there how you do it. Once again, thanks to our special guest, the great and wonderful Mr. Joe Lovano. It's been a real pleasure. And we'll see you next time at uh, On the Real Side. Yes.